Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. We're going to just wait a few moments as folks load into the Zoom room. So stand by. And good evening, classes of 2022 and 2021, students and parents. Um, welcome to tonight's town hall. Uh, We're so glad that you are joining us here this evening and we are very, very excited to be uh, welcoming you back in just a few short days at this point. Um, really crazy when you think about it. Uh, my name is Paul Pronovo. I am the chief communications and marketing officer here at the college and also a proud alumnus of St. A's. Uh, I will be facilitating the questions this evening, um, but mostly you'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Joseph Favaza, the president of the college, uh, Dr. Alicia Finn, who of course is vice president of student affairs and the dean of students, and Dr. Mark Cronin, who is the dean of the college. Uh, we also have a number of the Return to the Hilltop team members in the wings. Uh, so if your questions get particularly hard or technical, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, as Dr. Finn puts it, we're gonna phone a friend and, uh, and uh, get, get some more insight so we are able to answer your questions. Um, we're going to jump right in, but just uh, a couple of quick housekeeping items. First of all, and of course you are all veterans of Zoom at this point, uh, but if you have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, also, to, just as a note, um, we are closed captioning this uh, broadcast. Um, we also are recording this broadcast. So if you miss something or if you know someone who was unable to uh, be here this evening, we are recording it and we will post it on the website tomorrow. So, uh, and as a matter of fact, speaking of the website, um, I refer you to the COVID-19 response page, which has a treasure trove of information, including an FAQ, many of the questions you may have, may have answers there, um, surely not all of them, but, but there's a whole host of information about um, questions you might have, uh, the covenant that you have, uh, the students have received, um, health protocols, the academic calendar, um, really everything you wanna know about reloading the campus. So, uh, so it's there and available to you. Um, and then one last note, when it comes to sports questions, um, student athletes will be having Zooms with uh, athletic director Darren Montgomery and the coaches and athletic administration. Those sessions will be happening next week. Uh, most likely, if you are a Hawk athlete, you have received an invitation. And if you haven't, fear not, you will. Uh, they will be happening Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week. So that's it. Uh, let's get rolling right away. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Favaza. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I join Paul in uh, thanking you for joining us and, and to uh, share excitement about joining us on the Hill. He'll talk just in a, a few weeks, a few, few days at this point. Uh, so uh, from the very beginning uh, of this pandemic, as we were navigating some very uncharted territories and trying to make decisions, we were guided by some critical principles. The first one was keep the community safe. Uh, the second was do what is right by our students, our faculty, our staff, and our monastery. And finally, to maintain the perpetuity of St. Anselm College. And sometimes maintaining all three of those goals uh, is difficult. And sometimes they are in tension with one, one another. But uh, we are committed to reopening the college. We're committed to keeping students and the community safe. And we are committed to doing everything we can to provide the signature transformative experience that we, you have experienced already in your first two years uh, and will continue to experience when you return to the Hilltop. I will tell you that the campus is literally buzzing with activity. I was in my office today and Things are happening all over the place uh, to get ready for our reopening. We're very excited. We know that sometimes it's a difficult balancing act. Uh, 
between the need to take some pretty significant safety precautions in light of the pandemic, while at the same time planning for a, a vibrant campus experience that includes our excellent academics, our faculty have been working very hard, and includes uh, some very innovative co-curricular uh, activities and programs. So we can't wait to welcome you back. We're so glad you're here with us tonight. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Alicia Finn, our Vice President for Student Affairs. Thank you, Dr. Favaza. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you once again. 22 and 21, you are now the upper class men and women of campus. You're getting to be the old folk around here. That happened fast, didn't it? That you got to be juniors and seniors already. I sure look forward to seeing you once more on the hilltop, and that's right around the corner. I'd like to take a few minutes though to address two important subjects that surely have been on your minds. We've seen it in questions, um, and it keeps coming up as we're preparing for the semester. So after we're done with this, please feel free to ask for more detail during the Q&A section that comes later. So get ready to type in any questions you have. For we realize these issues and others are big ones for you, they're big ones for us. At the top of our list is testing. We're happy to have developed a system where all students will take two tests as they arrive on campus. And I emphasize that all students will take two tests as they arrive on campus. The more rapid of those will be used to determine the release from quarantine, the second one to verify the results. I'm sure you've heard in the news about the corona tests are taking sometimes five to seven, six to 10 days to get results. Well, we feel pretty confident that the rapid test will allow us to release you from quarantine within the 24 and 48 hour period. Once students are cleared by health services to leave the hall or your particular building, apartment building, um, after the initial quarantine time, be able to participate in programming outside the residence halls and ultimately onto classes. Of course, while you're waiting in the initial results to come in, we'll have some programming to keep engaged and entertained as well. Um, a lot of that programming will be listed on the hub, which was, if you recall, was up last year and it was all virtual. This time it's being used more as a calendar for there will be events certainly on the ground. The next layer of testing will take place throughout the semester. That's surveillance testing and that's gonna be done on regular intervals. A random group of students will be chosen from around the campus to test for any presence of the virus. This is gonna assist us in our containment and early identification processes. We'll also be testing those few groups of students that must go off campus with some regularity for things like internships, practicums, um, steady work that's needed for you to remain in college and the like. We ask that students, any of you that are in these circumstances, to stay in communication with Maura Marshall of Health Services so that she can not only be aware, but that she can offer the medical advice for health management that's related to the travel and potential exposures. Now, of course, we'll also be doing testing as a follow-up to those who did test positive and are in isolation housing or have returned home to assure their readiness for release from the isolation. We wanna get everybody on their way and back onto campus and into those courses that are happening on the ground. The second question that we're hearing a lot about is the question about returning home and family members visiting. Now regarding the return home, we ask that this occur only as truly needed. And again, please coordinate from a health standpoint with Maura Marshall. It's our hope that students, where family situations permit, refrain from distance traveling, especially utilizing public transportation. I wanna emphasize this is purely from the standpoint of mitigating potential areas of exposure and then spreading it on campus. We recognize that some situations are more difficult than others, and we're more than happy to work with your particular circumstance. So this is where Maura can really come in and assist greatly. Now, the other question was, can 
parents or family members come to visit. Again, we urge that this truly be as needed. If family members do come during the day, and it is during the day only, for we don't have overnight guests for the time being, certainly. If they do come during the day, we ask that this is in, not in the residence halls, not in the apartment area itself. We will have areas where folks can meet and visit. In either of these scenarios, traveling home or people coming to visit, please be sure to practice the good health hygiene practices that we've outlined, masks, social distancing, frequent hand washing, and things like that. Now, even though, you know, you're more senior now, parents, we know you will also miss your son and daughter still, and they will miss you as well. So we know that the semesters, you know it, 21 and 22, you know how semesters fly by. Thanksgiving's gonna be right around the corner and that'll make for a grand homecoming for all of you. 22 and 21, you are more experienced. You're the upper class men and women. It's to you and your example and leadership that our other classes look. It is your examples that set the tone. We can get through this semester and keep you on the ground, but only by our, all of our collective choices. 2021, you have the most at stake and none of us wishes to see you lose a moment on campus for your senior year. We will all succeed if we can adhere to the community care covenant and the health practices that are outlined there. And why do I know this? because we've proven it time and time again that we are in Selmians. We will be reflective, wise, caring, and strong. And please keep in mind, our good judgment is gonna be used for good choices. That's what will keep us on the hilltop. And I wanna see us on the hilltop. Well, I'm gonna stop for here for now, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Mark Cronin, Dean of the College, and also, the class advisor for the seniors. Good evening, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Some of you know the Dean's office is responsible for the curriculum, the faculty, and the academic uh, policies that affect our students. So I just wanna reiterate at the outset, something that Dr. Favaz has already said. Over the summer, we've been working tire tirelessly to get ready for the fall semester. And this work has been guided by a fundamental directive to make sure that we maintain our tradition of high quality, individualized instruction, even with the changes that are coming to the campus this fall. Some of those changes, as you know, involve your methods of instruction. And one of the most consistent questions we've been getting over the last couple of weeks is how in fact did we balance or divide the division or determine the division of online on ground and hybrid courses. And there's a process that went into that, but I'll give you sort of a straightforward, simple answer. So part of this was balancing competing demands, and those demands included some faculty who are unable to return to the physical campus on fall to, in the fall to teach. Uh, classrooms that have to be de-densified. One of the things that you will see when you arrive back on campus is that the classrooms themselves are different. We've pulled tables and chairs out of classrooms in order to accommodate social distancing protocols. Uh, you'll also see that we've put up tents and what we're going to call crop circles uh, on the quad to hold some classes outside if possible. We also have students who are unable to return for their own reasons uh, and that need a slate of remote instruction courses. So for that reason, most of you will see when you look at your schedule that you have a combination of online, on ground and hybrid courses. The next question that we've been getting most consistently is, you know, what exactly is a hybrid course? And a hybrid course is simply this. It contains elements of both on ground instruction and online or some version of remote instruction. But there's not a one size fit all to the hybrid courses. And you might have a professor who decides to record her lectures um, uh, for students to view remotely and then bring students to class, probably in smaller groups, 
one or two days a week for a discussion or, or a problem solving session. But other professors might do the exact opposite. They might want the students in front of them to lecture on complex, difficult material, and then to illustrate that material with examples before sending students off to work virtually in groups on problems or to have discussion sessions. So each professor is determining for herself or himself how to best deliver material in a hybrid environment. One of the features of that though that I think is a nice feature is if you have a hybrid class and you're meeting in smaller groups, you might be meeting with your professor in groups of seven or eight or 10 or 12. And it really allows that high um, engagement, that high factor of engagement between the faculty member and the student in the hybrid course. If you have questions about your schedule when you look at it and you wanna know or don't understand what the OL, OX, LC um, or LH mean, please contact either me or Dean Christine Gustafson, who works with juniors. We'd be happy to walk you through your schedule. So the next question that you might be asking yourself is simply this. The semester sounds like it's going to be different from an academic perspective. Will it be? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, the pandemic has forced all of us to examine how we teach, how we can retain the best of what we do, how we can innovate to meet the demands of the pandemic, and how we can still meet our very high standard of teaching excellence, given um, some of the things that we have to accommodate for. And I must say, I'm impressed by what the faculty are doing. Not only are they working hard, they're coming up with new ideas and new ways uh, to work with their students over the course of, of the fall. So, so yes, instructional methods have changed. But I know this, we have not changed our commitment to the individual student to, to do what we do best as a small college. And that's attention to the individual, uh, I, high quality engagement. I've been told not to use the phrase high touch because there's no high touch uh, in the fall semester, but that commitment to our student isn't changing. So that's it. I know you have lots of questions. Again, please feel free to reach out to either me or Dean Gustafson if you have questions about your academics in the fall. Paul? All right, thank you so much. Um, we're going to jump right into the questions. Again, use the Q&A function. Obviously, many of you already have because we, we got a bunch already. So let's get right into it. Um, Dr. Finn, this one is for you. When students leave campus uh, for Thanksgiving break, will they be told to move all their belongings or may they leave them there during the winter breaks and, and have them there when classes resume in the spring? Sure. Uh, we're not planning to ask you to do so, no. Um, at this juncture, you know, it'll depend where things are at at that point in time. If we anticipate, and I almost hate saying this out loud, if we anticipate that there's going to be a need to be remote in the spring, at that point, you would be taking everything with you. Or, God forbid, again, I don't want to talk like this, but if we have to order an evacuation, obviously you would take everything. But I know you're going to adhere to things, you know, and I can't implore you enough to be as careful as possible. So that said, we're not planning to have you take your things with you. All right, thank you. Um, this next one, we'll, we'll start with you, Dr. Cronin, but, but Dean Finn, you may also want to take it as it relates to both academics and health. My daughter is a nursing student. How are clinicals going to be taken care of this semester? So we have, uh, both Dean Gustafson and I have worked with Dr. Maureen O'Reilly over the summer. Uh, we're in regular contact with her. It is their plan right now to, to conduct the clinicals. Uh, they've been in contact with hospitals and other clinical sites. And right now the, um, they're moving forward with it. Have there been some changes to, to those clinical experiences? Sure. I mean, you know, the community health class used, goes to nursing homes. We won't be going to nursing homes um, in the fall except virtually. Um, in that case. But clinic, right now, clinicals are on track to occur. And, and uh, Dr. Finn, just in terms of, and I know you mentioned it during your opening remarks, but uh, nurses, of course, going out into hospitals, uh, nursing students going out into hospitals and then coming back, I'm sure that is an issue. I know we have a couple questions in here, so perhaps you could address how that might work as well. Um, yes, again, they would be part of that special group that has reason to go on and off regularly. And so they need to be in contact 
um, with Maura Marshall who can help with that, that program. Um, for some of the nurses, and depending where they're working, they're going to be in some areas that they're going to be get, getting testing on site or where they're working um, and have probably some of the greater controls over them. But if that's not one of the sites they're at, again, easiest answer is connect with Mora so that we can work out a, pl a plan for that. Can I jump in on this one too? Please. So um, I, the nursing department is acutely aware of this issue and when we have asked the directors and the nurses about this, you know, they have said uh, the hospitals, the nursing department uh, are, are very keenly aware. They are training the nurses in, in proper protocols for PPEs, proper protocols for, the, you know, making sure that um, their daily hygiene in terms of the uh, hand washing and the rest um, and clothing and how they're dealing with things and, and following the hospital protocols. They are, so they are some of the strictest protocols around. They know that uh, and the nursing department will be educating the nurses on this issue as well. And the nursing department has asked that their students get tested on a regular basis as well. And health services has agreed to do so. Terrific, thank you. Um, Dr. Favaza, uh, this one for you. Will there be a reduction in tuition with a number of remote classes? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, I can tell you that uh, I've been working with the senior team and with our board, looking at our pricing uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, I just want to remind you uh, something that Dean Cronin said at the very beginning that our faculty have been working extremely diligently and uh, conscientiously this summer to prepare their courses in a variety of formats, on ground, hybrid, and online. Uh, they, it will not be, I will just say this, it will not be the experience of the spring, which was a very, um, a very quick uh, transition that we made. Teaching remotely is not just teaching with Zoom. Uh, and, and I can tell you that uh, it's been an eye-opening experience to many of our professors. We are doing some creative things remotely, which includes uh, breakout sessions with students, discussion groups, even bringing in some pretty high profile guest speakers that we would never be able to do if we had to bring them to campus. So, uh, and even before COVID, a lot of our professors were experimenting with what we call flip classrooms, that is pre-recording their lectures and then having students watch them and then using that precious time in the classroom to engage that content in a way that uh, helps them to apply it to their own lives, uh, critique it and see if it is uh, uh, really a truth that they want to incorporate into their lives. So that's exactly what we're doing. I hope we can all agree that uh, education is more than just transfer of knowledge from the professor to the student. It's so much more than that. It's about engagement, it's about application, it's about integration, and it's about living that uh, in one's life. So our, our faculty are doing that. Uh, they're all teaching full load, so we're compensating them at their regular compensation. Uh, at the same time, we're providing some pretty high quality uh, academic assistance uh, through our Academic Resource Center, our Geisel Library, uh, through the Career Development Center, and other resources that are available to students. So th those all come with cost. And I can just say that uh, beyond that, uh, again, as Dean Cronin said, we are providing a very high quality education that you would not get at an, at an institution that is primarily online or known for its online offering. So uh, the answer is no, we're not reducing our tuition this fall for, uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this semester. Uh, however, obviously, in the, in the uh, hopefully the event that will not occur, but if we have to depopulate the campus, uh, like we did in the spring, uh, we will provide refunds for room and board uh, in that eventuality. And we'll, we're working on that, and we're certainly, uh, will be prepared for that. All right, thank you. We give the president the tough ones. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. Uh, Dr. Finn, um, this is, uh, and I'm going to expand on it because we have a number of questions on the same topic. Will there be any difference in food options on campus? 
And as you answer that, I wonder if you can talk about dining in general. Sure. Um, there will be some differences in terms of the fact that it will be primarily to go. Now, to go doesn't mean cold. So there will be some options. It may not be as broad as they were before, but there will be options for students on campus for dining. Um, I should make a footnote here that if you have particular dietary needs, especially during the quarantine time, we wanna make sure that um, you need to register with Rosemary so she can um, obviously still prepare according to your needs. But the way dining will work, especially during the quarantine time, is that you'll be um, told, notified to go to one of three places. Um, and you'll pick up your food at that point for the different meals. There'll be sort of a ticketing process for that. And you'll stay in that, go to that same area each time for a meal at that point. Um, after the quarantine time, you'll still be going to particular sites, um, certainly day, once everybody's moved in, it'll be Dave and coffee shop and whatnot, but you'll be eating in um, different areas of the campus if you've been released. Um, there'll be tents that are set up, there'll be some bench areas and whatnot. Um, you know, it's gonna be, the campus is gorgeous right now. There'll be some areas outside. Um, there's opportunities for that. Dave itself um, will be able to seat about 125 with the reduced density. That'll be on a first come first serve basis. Now, going through Dave and C Shop, uh, I'm sorry, going through Dave, there is an app for reservations. That's in order to control the amount of people going through the servery so that there's not only spacing, but we're able to accommodate the flow. Otherwise, that line's going to be out way the heck down past Dana. So we've utilized this campus app. Um, it'll be utilized in other areas as well. The coffee shop. Um, will be open and that is going to be takeout only. Um, if you think about that coffee shop area, especially in front of the counters, that's a pretty narrow passageway. We weren't able to find a way to accommodate uh, the particular flow and the density in that spot. So those are the kinds of things. If you're in the apartments, we are asking you to make sure that you're bringing ample food, especially through some of the quarantine periods. Um, mm -hmm. So you've been notified about that, really make sure that you're coming, you know, with a, a good amount, four or five days to make sure of minimally, um, to make sure that you've got what you need coming in, okay? All right, thank you so much. Um, another one for you, Dr. Finn, what student groups such as student government were consulted and included in developing the reopening plans? Okay. The reopening plans, a large portion of that, or a goodly portion of that, was really driven by health practices. So the construction was really around testing availabilities, what are some of the practices, CDC guidelines, other institutions, what they were doing. We were talking with um, public health, we were talking with CMC specialists, and we were talking with the state. Some of those things were non-negotiables. So first we struck, constructed all of that. We then had to look and see now in order to meet the requirements for quarantine and testing, tracing and the like, we then had to craft a move-in process to back into that. Students were not involved in that portion of it. It really was health driven in all complete honesty. The other portion though, where students began to come in and some, they were student leaders, and we asked them to be involved in generating some of the ideas of the different activities that would be hosted on campus, got some feedback about some of the thoughts we were having about how to flow things afterward, after the health components were in, um, but also to help us to make sure that we could put it out there in a manner that would be heard or helpful um, to you. So there was some, certainly some input, but the vast majority, I'm mean, complete honesty with you, was all health driven and guided by the practices that were not only emerging, but were continuously being changed by CDC or the state um, in order to kind of craft this safest entry um, and best entry for you. Going forward, um, student, students will have input, they'll be involved and will utilize the student government structure um, and test out some things on you as well. 
All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to follow up with with a question of my own because it's it's sort of it, it was implied there, but I think it also is coming up in a few others. Um, what sort of it's it, the campus is going to be restricted. So, and I'll throw this out to all three of you, and we'll start with you, Dr. Finn. How will this be uh, an enjoyable semester? We've certainly worked hard to make it that for you, and I think part of that is also what you bring to it. Um, there are will be a variety of experiences and events um, live, not all virtual. Some will be virtual. Many will be hybrid, but small groups will be able to gather, small groups. 25 is our limit here um, in the state right now. And so groups below that, or what if they're inside, certainly um, the space has something to do with that, but they'll be able to be um, gathered in order for clubs and orgs to meet, um, in order for gatherings for study can happen. Um, and we're looking at a number of outdoor kinds of venues um, exercise experiences. Um, we're hoping to have a variety of movies outside, whether it's um, a variety of yoga, um, other kinds of exercise and cut types of things, because we know how physically active you are. Things like the fitness center will be open. That'll be an option for students. Um, and CAB is working on a whole host of, of things as well. The different departments that you've come to know, campus ministry, intercultural center, and such as those sealed, they're working on reimagining the way those things are being offered. Again, um, some of it virtual, but most of it and much of it hybrid. So we're looking for those ways to be able to bring you together and have the usual experiences that you're used to. And we'll be capping you to kind of look at and see there is the opportunity to develop new traditions at the hilltop and look at the old ones and see how we revamp those in order to create them with that kind of special flair that will be all yours uh, for this coming year. So yes, um, there will be plenty to do and there will be all the same support services that were there, health, medical, the ARC, um, academic advising, the robustness of the, of the uh, service experience, but that done a little differently. So those things are all present for you. It's, a, it's up to us all to enter into it and then help to mold it to be all that you need it to be. So I'll, I'm just gonna say this. Uh, I talk to faculty and I talk to our deans all the time. We are looking forward to having the students back. The faculty will simply say they miss the students. They miss interacting with them. They miss the engagement that comes from the academic uh, experience I'm sure that's true of everyone who works on the campus. So uh, I simply believe there's going to be a, a sense of joy that will permeate the campus and get us coming back together. Uh, I won't go on. I think that says enough. Dr. Favaza. Well, I've said that uh, we are making plans to open St. Anselm College, not St. Anselm Prison. So it's going to be an enjoyable semester. But let me say this, and I want to reiterate something that Dean Finn said that uh, part of this will depend on students, that uh, it'll be critical that students abide by the community care covenant that everyone will be asked to sign and to uh, agree to commit to. So uh, we can make this an incredibly uh, productive, fun, innovative, and engaging semester if we can all take care of one another and follow the guidelines. If you come to campus and decide that that's not important to you, then we will all pay the price. So it is really critical that we follow the guidelines. And if we do so, I can guarantee you that the, that the year that we will have will be an exceptional one. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's see. Uh, well, this is a question, Dr. Finn, this is a question for you. Um, but I'm going to I'll ask the question, then I'll expand it a bit. Can students get a throat swab instead of the deep navel swa na uh, nasal swab, or will it be the lesser nasal swab? So obviously a question about testing. And can you just walk through a little bit about how the testing itself will work, maybe move into isolation, and even paying for the test? 
certainly. Um, well, let's answer it most directly first off. Um, it is not the long stick kind of scrape the top of your head. Um, it is a short swab to the lower portion of the nose. So it won't, it isn't the painful sort. Um, when you arrive, you've been given times to, uh, to come for your uh, arrival and testing. So your time that you're given is your testing time. So you need to plan accordingly for that. So that's where you're going to um, show up. We'll put you, if you recall during your own orientations, when you first arrived, remember we had kind of that line of, of traffic and then we flowed you through in a process. Um, we'll do the same and you'll have, you've received some direction about that, I'm pretty sure. So when you come in, you'll come through Sullivan on the side closest to New Lot and you'll come in those doors and be processed through and you'll receive the two tests. So the, they're both actually nasal swabs um, and they're the short version. Um, so you'll come through, do that. You have a couple of tables, you'll double check in. You'll receive a wristband and that wristband is one that signifies you have been tested and that you are to go ahead and move towards your residential area. And once there, um, that's when you'll take over to kind of finish moving in and there's a certain time frame that we've asked for that. With those wristbands, you need to remain in quarantine after you said so long to whoever's helping you. you. You are remaining in quarantine until you get your test results. Once those results come in and you'll get that from health services directly, you will then be given a second band, which then says you're able to move about the campus freely. It is a requirement that every student go through the testing and remain in quarantine. I'm gonna take a moment here now. I want you to know we have heard and learned about some who are thinking about trying to thwart the quarantine. That's not going to be tolerated. So you really need to follow those directions. So assuming you do, because you're good in cell means, um, once you're through that and you get the ban, you're able to move about campus. So the other part of that is that if you test positive at any point, so you get that, so one of those tests is the short one. So that's the one that will act as a release. The long-term one comes in to verify. If you're released under the short one, but the long-term one comes, the little longer one, the one that's about probably six to 10 days. When that comes back, if that shows that you are positive, and that's the more sensitive of those two, then you will move, be moved to an isolation area that is prepared. Um, your roommate, your room, your roommate will be tested again, your room will be cleansed that you left, and then you'll be in isolation for the period of time until it is that you test negative and in the appropriate time frame. That'll be done by medical guidance. Question about who pays for it. Um, so the way that goes is that the um, one that's being done by Clear Choice, so not the rapid one, the other, um, will wind up being um, billed to your insurance. That's why you're asked to bring your insurance card. Right now, those are covered. So there's no deductible and those are covered under insurance. The second, um, which is the shorter and the rapid test, and it's that one that will also be for all the surveillance testing that happens throughout the year. All of that is being paid for by the college. So um, that's not any fee that you, there's no extra fee in there and there isn't anything that will be charged to your insurance. So kind of in a nutshell, that's it. Um, and I hope I'm gonna ask if any of my um, colleagues on the end have anything that I left out of significance, but we might find other uh, questions along the line about that testing, so. I'm gonna leave you on the floor since we're on this topic. Let's, um, let's hope it doesn't happen, but let's say for a moment that someone during the semester tests positive uh, for COVID-19. What, what happens at that point? If during the semester they test positive for COVID, now there's a couple of scenarios in which that can happen. So if they're asymptomatic and they test positive, we'll move them into isolation. Um, and at that point, they'll wind up hopefully just remaining there for that amount of time that's necessary, again, under medical guidance. If they're obviously showing symptoms um, and test then positive, because some of those symptoms can be mixed, 
height, they could be for other things. But if they're showing symptoms and they test positive, we will be giving you a choice of going home. There are some families that would prefer to have their son or daughter home with them. That's not a requirement. That's going to be given as a choice. Otherwise, then, you'll be moved to isolation. And again, medically monitored, cared for, and hopefully recovered an appropriate amount of time so that we can then um, test you again. And we have to test hot negatively, obviously, uh, several times before we can release you from isolation. While in isolation, and if able, um, you will be able to continue in your coursework so the faculty will make accommodate work with you in order to get through that. And I'm gonna, in a moment, stop and toss that part over to Dr. Cronin. But that's how that will generally flow. Dr. Cronin, do you want to comment at all in terms of isolation and how the faculty will work with students? Sure. Um, so you know, the faculty are aware of the plans for the fall semester, obviously. Um, and they know that the range of activities that they're going to have, they might have to accommodate. So again, we're hoping for a good semester and that we, you know, we don't have to go remote or that uh, we don't have a lot of students who get sick, but we will work with students on an individual basis if they've been placed in quarantine and have to go remote for a period of time. Um, faculty were used to that last semester and th they know it's possible in the coming semester. All right, thank you. Dr. Favaza, coming back to you um, in a similar que question to what we uh, received last week, what sort of factors will be in play um, to either send students home or perhaps to loosen up some of the restrictions? Great question. Um, we uh, will be tracking, uh, obviously, our positive test uh, very closely. Uh, while we do have quarantine and isolation rooms, as Dr. Finn has said, uh, we're going to be making sure that uh, we have capacity. If we feel that uh, an outbreak is continuing to tick up, we will be uh, obviously in constant contact with the New Hampshire Department of Public Health. They will be advising us. And if we feel like we cannot uh, put in place any further safeguards to keep the cam uh, campus safe, uh, we will make a decision at that point. Obviously, it'll be a decision that will be jointly made along with the Department of Public Health. Uh, on the other hand, um, if we see that people are following the community care covenant and if we uh, are keeping the campus safe and our number of cases is low or, or nil, uh, yes, we, uh, Dr. Finn has said that we will continue to assess all of the uh, practices that we are putting into place. And if we can loosen some of those up, uh, we will. And, uh, and, and so it, it really depends on um, student uh, student commitment to the community care covenant. So uh, yes, yeah, so that the, both sides of that uh, could be possible, but obviously our very strong preference is that we, we do it in a way that we can eventually uh, move closer to uh, what would be typical on the campus for the fall semester. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Finn, we've had a, a few questions about masses and, and access to the Abbey Church. Uh, could you discuss that a bit for, uh, for as our students are returning? Uh, yes, there will be access to the Abbey Church masses for students. Um, certainly the, uh, the um, Abbey has opened itself, uh, will open masses rather for students, faculty, and staff. There's a certain amount of space and, and a number that will be there. Um, the, what we've done is that there's a 515 mass daily. Sometimes folks attend that. Um, you won't be able to attend in the choir stalls. That will be in the main church. The Wednesday night mass, which is uh, also popular among students, will be just for students, so no faculty and staff there, because that has a certain number of spaces as well. The Sunday masses, that will be open as, um, for us at the 11 o'clock, usually, that that occurs at. And so that's available. All of those, remember, will be in the main body of the church, and there will be spacing that will be there for folks. 
Um, and we ask that you adhere to that, you know, while we're in there. So masks is available to the college community. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cronin, coming to you, and I'm going to put two together here. Um, let's see. Uh, are classes being held straight through Thanksgiving with essentially no breaks for Labor Day, Columbus Day? And then related, will any final exams be held in person during the week of November 20th as opposed to uh, having online exams in December? So uh, good questions and the answers are both related. So when we redid the, the calendar, we still stick to the mandated number of days and contact hours for our students. So we still have the same number of, of classes as we, as we would in a normal semester. The way we did that is to eliminate breaks like Labor Day and Columbus Day, ones we all um, like and enjoy, but it, it made the, the calendar work better. And frankly, we've talked to the faculty about it. I mean, I know there's a rhythm to the semester. Um, all of the deans teach, we know that as well. So, I mean, I, I think there'll be times when the pedal, you know, the, the foot comes off the pedal a bit, or at least I hope so. The second question about, about exams is, exams will not be given the week of, that ends with, on, on November 20th. Exams will occur uh, the week after Thanksgiving. It's, I think it's December 3rd through December 9th. All right, thank you. Um, I'm shocked it took us this long to get uh, to these questions right here, but Dr. Finn, too, um, for you, if students are not allowed to leave campus, will the college provide basic cleaning supplies um, uh, and other provisions? And also, will students be able to leave campus to go grocery shopping? And what is the protocol in those instances? Students are allowed to leave campus um, to do shopping including their cleaning supplies. Um, that would be considered something that you need to do, um, especially those apartment areas, um, you're cooking for yourself, right? So that's permitted. Um, and what we're asking to make sure is when you do that, and this is actually being supported by many of the shopping areas nearby and a lot of the store, well, more and more of the stores right now, you have to wear masks when you go. You do have to social distance. There are markers just like wherever you are, that your stores, I'm sure, have those there. So as long as you keep practicing those, those pieces, we're all set. So you can go shopping when you need to um, and come back to the campus. Um, you can get your food, your cleaning supplies, um, those things that your personal items, those things that you need. So there isn't that ban in doing that. So you're able to go. Just be wise. All right, I just came on, upon another one that's, that's a, a very interesting one and, and somewhat related in terms of moving about. How would the college advise some of the political groups on campus to conduct their business in an election year? Knocking on doors, offsite events, things of that nature. If you're going regularly because that's part of the work that you have been assigned or you have a job for, that's one that you're going to want to really talk to more Marshall about. You're moving about, you're getting exposed to a wider array of folks. Um, and so that's one where we want to work out a plan for some increased testing for you. When it comes to voting, I guess, I guess I'll try to do another, anticipate another question potentially for folks. Um, we won't be hosting those things on campus. And when it comes to actually voting, um, we're encouraging everybody sign up for your absentee vote now. Um, it's not the case to go back down to various states um, in order to vote. I know that's a, that's a monumental thing for folks and it might be for some of you your first presidential election, but it will need to be absentee so that we can again, mitigate any potential transmission back to the campus. I remind us, our goal is to stay on the hilltop keep 21, keep getting all the ter their time that they can still here with us on the campus. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cronin, um, are education majors able to leave uh, to complete their internships in person at school systems around St. A's and how does leaving campus affect this? It's a good question. My understanding is that the education department uh, redid the fall schedule and students will not be doing placements in the fall. They moved everything 
to the spring and potentially some some during winter if possible. Um, but you know, schools were not allowing placements in their schools um, for the fall, so they changed things up to it to accommodate that. Fair enough. And another one for you while you're in the spotlight. Oh, switch sure. to me before I could say it. Um, will office hours be based on the professor or will it be based on the method of the class? Well, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, it probably a bit on the method of the class. If a person is teaching remotely and not coming to campus, my expectation would be that the office hours were going to be held remotely. And I expect in general that we will see more office hours being held through things like Zoom or virtual appointments. Um, we do want to de-densify. Uh, we've asked faculty not to come to campus every day if they don't need to, if their teaching schedule allows that so that there is some de-densification of campus. So my expectation would be, and I think the student expectation would be, is that in many, but perhaps not all, cases of students visiting office hours might be doing that virtually. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Dr. Finn, will we be tested before returning home for Thanksgiving as to mitigate risk to our families? You know, we haven't, um, we haven't walked all, that all the way through. So that's parts of the conversations that we'll have. Um, it'll also much depend on what's going on in our world and environment at this point, at that point in time. Um, it, it could be an option, but again, we're going to look for some input. Um, families may have a say in that. Um, definitely, though, if your families are talking about concern, if you're going home to a situation where you have someone in your family, um, an older person who's living there, autoimmune kinds of issues, um, we'll definitely work with you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, uh, another one for you, Dr. Finn. How will the library and student center be functioning in terms of social distancing? Are these spaces open for students to sit and do homework uh, or are they uh, open only for necessities such as printing, mail center, et cetera? Both those locations will be open. Um, you hear us using this word de-densification. I don't think it was a word until COVID. But what we've done is gone through and changed some things up. So we've taken some furniture out in some places, put it in others. Um, we did get feedback of, from student government and student leaders that the preference in the student center, for example, would be that don't worry about using up all the space for the games area, but rather put more tables and chairs in there so that we would have more study space. So we've tried to maximize that for you. Um, so that will be available. There'll be some classrooms, for example, that um, may not be suitable for course for offering courses because they're just small enough that we can't get a section in there or even half a section if people were gonna offer and teach it twice. So those will be available for some study space and whatnot. The library will be open. Um, and again, it's going to have all kinds of marker um, on it to show what's available What's the spacing? What's the flow? The reality is I, next Wednesday, I think we're all volunteering and getting together. There's something like 65,000 pieces of marker, whether it's floor, wall, direction signs, whatever, that we're all fanning out and putting out all over campus so that it'll be easily seen what we're talking about. Um, and so you'll, 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 you'll get it. We'll also have available that listing of those newer spaces for study spots that um, you may not have typically thought of before. I've said it in multiple kind of places. I also urge you, again, the fall when is one of the most spectacular times on campus. Although when is it, right? It's a beautiful hilltop. But you'll be able to utilize outside as well. Um, so again, we're, we're working as hard as we can to make sure and scrounge out those other kinds of spaces. Once you get here, look at that, look for some more, let us know, and we'll, we'll work those into the system. And Paul, can I jump in? Please. Yeah, I just want, because I think it's important to know. So uh, we've been working with the library and as Dean Finn has just said, we are de-densifying. It will only allow for about 33% of its, 
of its original capacity in terms of students. And it, it is for that reason that we have, when we re-roomed all the classes on campus, and you will see if you had your schedule from the spring that it might have changed, uh, that there are some rooms in alumni, uh, in Gadbois, in the NHIOP that are dedicated solely as study spaces. So for you students out there, LL3, LL, LL2, LL5, 16, and alumni, we're not having any classes in. And so if people want to study in there, we're going to keep, we're going to redo the room a bit, tables, chairs, desks, so students can study. Paul. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I just had a question pop up about uh, masks. Where will masks be uh, required on campus, uh, Dean Finn? And, and also, uh, I have another question here. Uh, will the school be providing masks? So the masks will be, be required in all public spaces, not, not in your rooms, you know, um, not in that kind of sense. Um, but when you're in the hallways, you know, when you're in class, when you're going about the campus, um, we're going to require masks. You know, when I leave and go down the hall, I'm wearing a mask. So masks are really our key. You know, I'm sure you've seen it on YouTube or the news or whatever that they've really shown, you know, that the difference between wearing a mask and not wearing it and what particles are admitted into the air is pretty striking. So the combination of the mask and the distancing, that's really what has led many times um, until this recent resurgence to that reduction of what we had seen earlier. So the mask is really on one of our number one um, fronts for keeping this contained. Um, in terms of uh, will we be getting masks, um, I don't want to take a written Kevin's thunder, um, but actually give them a, a claim and applause for it. Um, SGA has purchased uh, masks for everybody. So when you come through the testing area and the, and the check-in, you'll receive a mask from them. In addition, though, we're asking you to make sure you're bringing at least three or four masks that can be washed and reused. I mean, if you want to use the one, use one toss away, you're welcome to. Um, but we want to make sure that you have enough masks to use throughout the time, because that's going to, it's a critical piece. And it's a piece that we'll be reminding each other about all the time. All right, thank you. Um, uh, we're, we're coming close to the end. And I know we have a number of questions uh, remaining. Hopefully, we got to the big ones. Um, let me just say that uh, if you do have questions that were not answered this evening, please do reach out to the appropriate people. Many of them are here. You'll find others uh, certainly on the website. As, as upperclassmen, you, you probably know exactly who um, to reach out to. So please do that. Um, and also keep watching the website. A lot of these uh, town halls with all these great questions have allowed us to build out the FAQ even further. So that's a living document. When we see big questions, we try to answer them. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. Um, one last question, Dr. Finn, for you, before we turn it over to Dr. Favaza. Um, it, as a parent, I'm most concerned about shared bathrooms in residence halls. Now, now before I go on, obviously that would be, it's a, it's a longer question, but I think that's a, you, you get the gist. And, and of course, that's part of it, the heart of some of the restrictions you have put in place on, on residences? Uh, we have. We're really look, thinking of, we had to think about the bathroom situation. And we had to really construct around that, that we've talked about at times or referencing in your reading, you've seen it called the family unit. That can be your room, that can be a wing, but it really is centered around the use of the bathroom. So we are limiting the number who are going to be utilizing that space. Um, we have increased our cleaning. That will be not only frequency, but the, the style of cleaning um, and even some of the mitigation um, techniques that they're using. In those bathrooms, you're also going to see that between the sinks, in the, in the more traditional halls, between the sinks are actually um, plexiglass so that you are separated from the other who might be you know, whatever in the sink. Um, we've also though, again, centered around the bathroom as a unit. That means each apartment is a unit. So it's not community, okay? So it's not, it's not all of St. Benedict or all of Father Bernard Court. It is, the unit is 
that apartment because that's the unit um, that's utilizing those bath facilities. So there will be cleaning of that. That'll be increased, as I said, um, and that's um, how we're hoping to kind of govern and, and fix that up. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Finn and, and Dr. Cronin um, for tonight and for the past few nights. Um, this has been very informative. Let's turn it over to Dr. Favaza for some final thoughts. Again, just say thank you for joining us tonight, uh, taking some time out of your evening. Again, I, I just can't say enough how excited we are. We are uh, doing everything we can. We're, we're trying to dot every I, cross every T. Uh, luckily, we have a great team of professionals here working at St. Anselm. We're trying to think through every issue. And uh, we are, want to be in partnership with our parents and guardians uh, as we work together this semester uh, to make this a, success, a successful semester for each of our students. So again, we look forward to seeing you very soon on the Hilltop. and. Um, I hope you have a good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us and uh, good night.